Okay. <clears throat> so we've gotten to the point now where we, we know enough or we've covered enough that it may start to get to be too much if there's not an organization. Okay, so you can simplify the human body down to, in this very simplistic way in terms of the organ systems, or at least the, the major organ systems. So we started out in this semester here talking about the cardiovascular system, right? So that's the heart and the blood vessels constantly circulating around the body. So that's, that, that's their job. Then we added to it the respiratory system, right? So that's up here. This is an alveolus. So this is where oxygen is going to come in to that cardiovascular system and CO2 is going to go out, like we learned in um, the respiratory chapter, the last one we did. Today, we're going to start in here. So in um, addition to carbon dioxide being low and oxygen being high, cells also need some other things, right? They need nutrients. So that includes water, because it's the digestive tract in, in us humans where the water comes in. And that's also the carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids that it takes to fuel cellular metabolism, growth, and all of that. Okay, so this is where we're at today. So this essentially tube is going to take nutrients that we eat apart and then absorb those nutrients into the cardiovascular system. So obviously the cardiovascular system is not the end point though. The end point is over here. So all of the cells of the body have these needs, right? They need to get rid of carbon dioxide, that's in blue. They need to get oxygen, that's in red. They all need nutrients to do their thing, so that's in black. And then finally, they're gonna create waste products that have to be eliminated from the body through the urinary system, which we're gonna talk about in the last unit, in unit four. Um, so we have kind of our simplified box diagram. Okay, so we're gonna be focusing in over here. All right. <clears throat> so we divide up the digestive tract in a couple of different ways, but one is as the tube and as organs that work with the tube. And here's what I mean by the tube. The digestive tract is a continuous tube from the mouth to the anus at the other end. And it has a lumen that continues all along that course. It does not branch, you know, so it doesn't split and come together. It is one long tube. Now, the tube changes as you go from mouth to anus, but it is still one long tube. So that tube, we call that the digestive tract or the GI tract. A tract is a path, right? That's what that word means. So it is a path of digestion that starts here and ends here. And along that path, okay, we have the mouth and the oral cavity, right? Then we have the esophagus, much more on all these as we go here. The esophagus empties into the stomach, so that's this organ right here. The stomach empties into the small intestine, which goes, winds around quite a bit. There's about 22, 27 feet in there of the small intestine. Then we end up at the large intestine down here. The large intestine goes up, across, down, kind of around, and then out at the anus. So those are the parts of the digestive tract, the GI tract, we call that. Sometimes in the land of clinical medicine, we also call this the gut, right? So the gut is not necessarily the uh, adipose tissue, it's actually this digestive tract where nutrients are going to cross, because it's the digestive tract is where the business happens. But this tract can't do what it does all by itself. So there needs to be some other organs that assist. So we call those the accessory organs. So it starts in the mouth with the salivary glands. They're not part of the tube, but they put stuff into the tube. They put stuff into the mouth in this case. Then we get down, the liver is um, a, the largest organ in the body, well, the largest solid organ anyway. Um, and it produces a, a lot of secretions that are placed into the digestive tract and participate in making digestion happen. Then we have the, uh, the pancreas, which uh, sits here underneath the stomach, the gallbladder, which is part of the liver. Um, so we have four accessory organs and then a long tube that has different regions. Okay, so we're going to go sort of, that's the overview. Now we'll get into a little more detail. There are many ways of learning about the digestive tract, and different textbook authors take different approaches. And 
the, the authors for your particular textbook don't use this system, but many uh, textbooks do. And I think it's it, for many people, it is still a good system, even if it's not how your book does it. Okay, so here's what I mean by that. As you'll see, the digestive tract is quite probably the most complicated organ system in the body, simply because it has all these different things that it does, and it's made up of many different, very diverse parts. Okay, so even though the heart, you know, we know a lot about it and there's a lot of complexity in it, it isn't like the digestive tract where you have giant organs that do huge things like the liver and the pancreas. Okay, so one way of kind of organizing your thinking about this elaborate system called the digestive tract is using these four terms. Okay, so the first is motility. Motility is how things move. Okay, the second is digestion. You'll know what I say, digestion is a chemical word. Digestion is something that can happen in a beaker, in a laboratory. Okay, digestion is taking a large complex molecule and breaking it into simpler molecules, period. That's digestion. Anytime that happens, that's digestion. It could be in a beaker, it could be in an animal, it could be um, in uh, even in the ground. Digestion happens, fungus make digestion happen. Okay, so there's that piece. Motility, moving, digestion, chemistry. Absorption is where um, things are coming in to the organism, right? Typically those are gonna be nutrients. And then secretion is where the body is putting something in to the digestive tract to make something happen. Okay, so why these four words? Well, everything that the digestive tract does in the end can, falls into one of these four categories, right? So each part of the digestive tract has a motility, a digestion piece, an absorption piece, and a secretion piece. And if there was one more word to add to this, it would be control, because all the different parts of digestion have to be controlled as well. So that's another piece that we're going to talk about. So even though your book doesn't break this down in these four words, I put it in here as an extra, because I do think it's useful when you get into some of the more complicated um, parts of that. Okay. So the most of the digestive tract is small and large intestine, right? And the small and large intestine shares, share some uh, common uh, anatomic features. So before we get into the different uh, regions, we can look at some of those common features and you'll get a sense of what the rest of the tube looks like. Okay, so this is just a representative section. Uh, in this case, this is small intestine. But many uh, places in the digestive tract share these features. All right, so we'll start on the inside, all right? So this is the lumen. So that word lumen, it means the inside of a pipe or the inside of a tube. And the digestive tract has a lumen. So do a lot of other things, right? We talked about the lumen of arteries, the lumen of veins. The trachea has a lumen where there's air. So this is a common word. And so what we find in the digestive tract here, these are um, ultimately it's what's in the lumen started as something eaten or drank, right? So that's what fills the lumen. Now, that changes in consistency and character from food that we eat to feces that comes out the other end. So what the contents of the lumen is going to change. All right, so that's here. And we see, the first thing you should notice is that it's wrinkled. Wrinkles are critical aspect of the digestive tract. And um, the reason for wrinkles is it's the same reason why we have a wrinkly brain. And that is surface area. The more surface area you have, the more stuff, the more work you can do, um, at least at the cellular level. And the digestive tract has a lot of work to do. So it has a ton of surface area. And what we see in the anatomy is that it's folds. We have folds of folds of folds, right? So you see these big folds with the naked eye, and you can see them in the cadaver too. Um, which hopefully you'll get to see them last. <coughs> Have you guys been in the cadaver lab yet at all in lab? Who has? No? Not in lab. Not in lab? Okay. I'll talk to him. It's Will, right? Mm -hmm. Is your lab instructor? Yeah. I'll see if we can get Because for the digestive tract, it's useful, really. Because you can see these folds. Okay, and then <clears throat> the folds themselves are lined with, like, carpet. 
You know, if you've ever looked at carpet real close, it's made up of these little tufts, right, of, of fibers. Well, our digestive tract is sort of carpeted like that too. It has these little tufts that stick up. And then if we were to zoom in to one of these little tufts, the tufts have tufts, right? So you, the wrinkles, the folds have folds, have folds, have folds. Okay, so what we see here in the inside is the innermost layer, this carpeted layer, and that's the mucosa. Okay, so the mucosa is what is in contact with the contents of the lumen. So a lot of in, uh, interesting and important things happen at this mucosal layer because that is what's in contact with what we've eaten or drank. Okay, so that's the business end, is the mucosa. Underneath that, so in purple here, <clears throat> we have a layer called the submucosa. This is an irregular connective tissue. Okay, its job is really to hold the mucosa onto the underlying layers. Now we also find in this submucosa arteries, veins, lymphatics, and nerves too. So it's a place for um, those things to travel. Underneath the submucosa, we have two layers of smooth muscle. Right? You see how there's two layers shown here. <clears throat> we have the uh, so we have we call that the muscularis externa and the muscularis interna which I'll show you more about that in a minute. And then around the outside of the tube, we have a slippery membrane called serosa. Because the digestive tract kind of hangs in the abdominal cavity. So it has an inside in here. It also has an outside out here. So the different, um, you know, so say you've got small intestine, you've got a tube going this way and a tube going this way because it's bent, right? So they have to be able to slide on each other in your abdomen. That's what the serosa is for, is to be nice and slippery so that the tube doesn't get all snarled and stick to itself. Okay. And then um, the whole tube for the small and large intestine hangs from the back of the abdominal wall by this sheet called the mesentery, which I have better pictures of later. Okay, so we have mucosa, submucosa, the muscularis uh, layer, and then the serosa. So like I say down here, not all areas of the GI tract do, but foot for foot, most do, as we'll see as we go. All right. So more on those folds. Okay, so we're going to zoom in to one of these macroscopic folds, and you can see the carpet, so to speak. We have these little tufts that stick up. <clears throat> Each of those little tufts is called a villi. And if we zoomed in to look at a villi, it looks just like this, okay? Because the villi have cells that have um, little villi of their own. So the folds have folds. More pictures of that later, okay? And I talk about the reasons for that, okay? Um, <clears throat> uh, we're gonna cover all those things later. Okay, so, <clears throat> we so far in this course, we've talked about Skeletal muscle, you talked a lot about that, I'm assuming. That was before I took over. But skeletal muscle, we talked a little bit about cardiac muscle and how it was similar to skeletal muscle. So here's our third kind of muscle. There's only three kinds of muscle in the body. Skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Smooth muscle, in many ways, is the very different one. Um, smooth muscle gets its name because it's not rough. Remember when you looked at skeletal muscle under the microscope? and it had kind of that bumpy appearance. Smooth muscle does, isn't bumpy, so that's why we call it smooth. It's not like it's particularly smooth to the touch. I mean, it's no smoother than skeletal muscle is, but it has to do with its microscopic appearance. And <clears throat> so there are big differences between smooth muscle and other kinds of muscle in the body. One is, okay, no striations. And the reason there's no striations is because there's no sarcomeres. So remember the sarcomere was that rigid arrangement of thin filaments and thick filaments in a very re repetitious order, you know, that gives that light and dark appearance. Well, there are no sarcomeres in smooth muscle. Now, there are thick filaments and thin filaments. There's actin and myosin, and there's tropomyosin and troponin. All of your friends are there, um, but they are a little different than their skeletal muscle cousins. All the proteins are different. Um, <clears throat> and there's no sarcomere orientation. So instead, in smooth muscle, the thick and thin filaments are kind of spread out in a lattice work of sorts. Um, and you can see it pretty well in this picture, that there are these 
uh, rigid points or hangers from the inside of the cell membrane. And then connected to those hangers are these sort of wispy threads of thick and thin filaments here in purple. Okay. Now, thick and thin filaments, when they interact, when calcium is present, tr troponin, tropomyosin, you remember all that, calcium makes muscle contract, right? The myosin heads pull on the actin threads and things get smaller. Well, without sarcomeres, the pattern of contraction changes in smooth muscle. You know, in a skeletal muscle, all the, everything's parallel. So when it shortens, it, it shortens in just one direction, right? And that's all it knows how to do. Smooth muscle shortens in lots of directions at once because you've got, instead of parallel thick and thin filaments, you have this lattice work instead. So we go from kind of a, <clears throat> an eyeball-shaped cell <clears throat> to a cell <clears throat> that's kind of wrinkly. This is hard to picture in three dimensions. You just have to imagine a, a cell of a shape. What if all of its membranes pulled in towards all of its other membranes? Well, it would get kind of squished, right? Like like a purse if you pulled and made it smaller. So that's what we get here. So we get this, this is relaxed, and this is contracted. And the thing to note is, instead of just shortening in one direction, it shortens in all of its directions at once, which makes smooth muscle ideal for the complex three-dimensional shape of the digestive tract, right? You know, this thing, there, it's round, right? It's a tube. Well, how do you contract around a tube? Well, you need to contract in more than one direction at a time, and that's what smooth muscle does. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, <clears throat> this just shows you some pictures. The thick and thin filaments are sort of spread out like that. Um, the dense bodies are these uh, structures. They're kind of like anchor points so that the thick and thin, thin filaments connect to the cell membrane to give it something to pull against. And this is sort of the networks that they form. So when they contract, I do want you to, this is worth highlighting. Calcium is still the trigger of contraction for smooth muscle. Okay, just like it is in skeletal muscle, just like it is in cardiac muscle. You know, that whole troponin, tropomyosin system that you learned so much about, it really is in all three muscle types. You know, so you should have linked in your brain somewhere that calcium makes contraction. Okay, because it's always calcium that does that. Um, <clears throat> because one of the fatal features of not having enough calcium is that muscle doesn't contract. You know, so if you give somebody a calcium binding agent like EDTA that sucks calcium out of their, um, their plasma, they very quickly die after that because none of their muscle can contract, including the heart. You know, so a um, <clears throat> little bit on smooth muscle. Questions about smooth muscle before we go? One of the pivotal points in this chapter of the list. Okay. <clears throat> so how does smooth muscle contract? It's quite a bit different than skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle. Okay, so in skeletal muscle, there's that neuromuscular junction, right? The nervous system goes right up to the, to the skeletal muscle, sends a signal, sends acetylcholine across the synapse, and that triggers that cascade of um, uh, calcium being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And in cardiac muscle, cardiac muscle contracts all by itself, right, in that cycle that's brought about by the conducting system. Well, what about smooth muscle? Well, there's two different patterns <clears throat> for smooth muscle activation. One is sort of like skeletal muscle on a teeny tiny microscopic scale. That's this one. Multi-unit smooth muscle <clears throat> works as uh, the nervous system triggers smooth muscle cells to contract. So it's sort of analogous to skeletal muscle, right? Skeletal muscle doesn't contract unless the nervous system sends a signal. Well, this multi-unit smooth muscle it works in that same way. But instead of one nerve to one uh, muscle or muscle, muscle fiber, here we have many nerves. Or here, let me get my pointer here. We've got multiple nerves, each of which has multiple spots, and each of these multiple spots affects multiple nerves. Do you see why we call it multi-unit? Because there's all these multis in there, right? So many nerves with many um, spots for activation activate many cells. This is pretty rare in the body. Multi-unit smooth muscle isn't found in very many places. Um, it's found in the eye, in the lens. Um, this is very fast. 
The multi-unit smooth muscle is fast, so that's where the body uses it. It's in places that need quick smooth muscle contraction. Um, <clears throat> we find it in the large arteries. We also find it in the, um, the erector pili, the goosebump muscles um, are activated in this fashion, right? <clears throat> well, most smooth muscle in the body, though, is this type, visceral smooth muscle. And the best way to think of this is smooth muscle cells, kind of like heart cells, they don't work alone. They're very connected to their neighboring smooth muscle cells. So, you know, just like a group of people that's, that's very close and interconnected, when something affects one of them, it very quickly affects all of them, right? Well, smooth muscle is just like that. The cells are constantly in communication with each other so that when one of the cells is stimulated to contract, they all contract. You know, so they work as a team and they all contract in, in a group, making um, that the two smaller. I'll show you some examples of what smooth muscle does here in a minute. Now, you also see, okay, here's a nerve, right? And it shows neurotransmitter coming out. What I do not want you to think is that this contraction requires nervous system input because it doesn't. One of the things that sets smooth muscle apart, this visceral smooth muscle apart from skeletal muscle, is it doesn't actually need the nervous system to participate. So kind of like cardiac muscle, it can contract on its own. Smooth muscle can contract on its own too. And it can contract all by itself without nervous system intervention in response to different things too. You know, so not only calcium, but other things, you know, like a change in pH, for example, can cause smooth muscle to contract. So it's much more independent of the nervous system than skeletal muscle is. You know, skeletal muscle doesn't do anything without nervous system making it happen. Visceral smooth muscle, not so much. Okay, so um, even though their nerves do affect smooth muscle, but it isn't sort of, it isn't like the cause and effect that you see in skeletal muscle. Okay. So this is the most common one. This is the very odd one. All right. <clears throat> so why do we need smooth muscle to contract in the first place? <clears throat> because things have to move. You know, we've got a tube that's some, you know, 25 feet long. And ultimately stuff has to move from the beginning of that tube to the end. So we need to have motility. And Essentially, we have two different kinds of motion that happen in this digestive tract tube. One is propulsion. In other words, we have to move things from start to finish. And we call that pattern of muscular activity peristalsis. Now, that's a word most of you will have heard at some point in your life. Um, peristalsis is simply muscular contraction of a tube in a pattern that pushes something forward. You know, so... Again, this, I wish I had a movie for this, but I don't. Um, you know, so here's the, the, the contents. <clears throat> we get a little contraction behind it, and then a little more, and then a little more, and then a little more, and eventually this thing gets pushed through. You know, and a kind of strange analogy here is if, if you took a, you know, a softball and you put it through um, a, a sock, you know, one way you could do that is with peristalsis. You could squeeze behind the ball, and the ball would move forward until it came out the other end, right? If you cut the end of the sock off. So same thing is happening there. And this is contraction of um, both of the layers of the tube. Here, let me... Did I miss a piece? Hold on a minute. Okay, more on that later. The, t the, uh, the tube has two layers, okay? A circular layer and a longitudinal layer. Okay, so the longitudinal layer is on the outside, circular is on the inside. What do I mean by that? Again, this is hard to do with three dimensions, but okay. So on the outside of the tube, the smooth muscle fibers are lined up like this. Okay. Now, they're not perfectly parallel like you see in skeletal muscle. Okay, it's a kind of generally they're going that way. And then the innermost, the layer inside of this one, if you took this layer off, the fibers go around the circle. Okay, so they go all the way around. Does that kind of make sense? I can't draw three dimensions, right? They go all the way around. So we call the inner layer the circular layer because they're aligned in circles around the tube. 
and the longitudinal layer we call the longitudinal layer because it goes along the, the long axis of that. And in peristalsis, both participate in that. So they squeeze behind this and eventually they push things forward. So that one you've heard about before. <clears throat> the other one you probably haven't heard about, and that's segmentation. So the, you know, we think of our digestive tract as a pipe. You know, and we're familiar with pipes, but the pipes that we're familiar with in our everyday lives are rigid pipes. Well, the, the intestines are alive. <laughs> so instead of being an open tube, they're actually squeezing around the contents all the time. Okay, very different than a plumbing pipe does. So in segmentation, all the time as stuff is passing through this region, it's getting mixed up all the time. So the digestive tract squeezes around the contents, and that pattern of squeeze changes, right? So here we've got this pattern, and now the middles of this are also going to squeeze, and now this part is relaxing, and this part is contracting, so we get this mixing. Okay, another example. If you were going to take, like, frosting, and you were going to, and you wanted to mix it in a tube, you know, what would you do? Well, you'd keep squishing on the tube, right? Squish, 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 and so it was all mixed up. That's exactly what's happening in your digestive tract all the time. So we call this segmentation. And it does two things. One is it mixes things up. The other is it pushes the mucosa into the contents of the uh, um, digestive tract. So it's at the mucosa where the, the work of digestion and absorption are done. So by pushing that mucosa into the um, contents all the time, it increases efficiency so that we're able to get more nutrients out of the food we eat more quickly. Okay? So segmentation and peristalsis, the two most common kinds of motility that you find in the small and large intestine particularly in the small intestine. Okay. <clears throat> so if you've got this 25-foot long organ system, there has to be some way to coordinate what's happening at one place to what's happening in another. You know, in many ways, the digestive tract is the most complicated thing that we do every day, you know, because of all the different pieces that have to happen. So we have multiple layers of control that make this possible. Okay, so this slide's all about control. Okay, so here's our digestive tract. Here's the mucosa, right? Wrinkles, when you see wrinkles, that's mucosa. Here's the submucosa underneath. Arteries, veins, nerves, lymphatics. Here's that circular layer of smooth muscle. Okay, and then here's that longitudinal layer. And then along the outside is gonna be the serosa. So it's just like our previous picture, only this one's in cross section, right? So all the time, these cells that are lining this surface and the cells underneath it in the submucosa, they're affected by what's in here um, because there's so much surface area. This is so wrinkly, and the surface is very, very thin. What is happening in here is going to affect what's happening in here, too. So, for example, when the pH in here changes, you know, say you, uh, you've eaten a meal, and your stomach is starting to empty into your uh, small intestine, into the duodenum. Well, this, what comes out of the stomach is very acidic, so the pH drops. Well, in response to that, these cells of this area will change their behavior. In, in some cases, they'll, um, you know, they'll create buffers to uh, negate that low pH. They might create mucus as protection. Lots of things happen. But the short version is local factors make local changes. So when things change in the lumen, the cells in that region change what they do in response to that. So it means that the, the digestive tract itself is always responding to what's passing through it. And that seems simple, but it saves a, a lot of complexity for our digestive tract. If we didn't do this, if the brain had to control every little inch of the small intestine, we would either need a much larger brain or we would not have much brain to do much other fancy stuff like learn about anatomy and physiology, right? So this is simple, but it's functional. The cells respond to their local environment, which cells do anyway, 
And in, in, by doing so, they help to coordinate digestion through the whole digestive tract. Okay, so that's local factors, number one. The digestive tract has a nervous system of its own. We call that the enteric nervous system, which I'm not sure if that phrase is used in here, but it should be, the enteric nervous system. Uh, we, it's beyond our scope of detail, but the digestive tract has two separate nerve plexuses. A plexus is a complex network. So there's a complex network in the submucosa, and there's another complex network um, out here uh, uh, further out. Both of those together have as, about as many neurons as half a brain. So you're talking about a huge amount of nervous tissue that's part of the digestive tract. And that enteric nervous system is the brain for the GI tract. Okay, so the brain itself does not do very much with digestion. But these nerves that are present in the digestive tract do. So we call those neural control mechanisms. They work in the, in the local region as a short reflex, and they work in the longer reflex that includes the central nervous system as well. But most of that happens in these short reflexes. So the enteric nervous system is made up of the neural plex or the myenteric plexuses, and it makes these myenteric reflexes. So things like peristalsis and segmentation, that's the enteric nervous system is coordinating that. So the gut's built-in brain. GI tract built in brain. Um, it's one of the reasons why you know, we have very little conscious perception of digestion, of things passing through our digestive tract. Part of the reason for that is there really isn't a strong connection between the brain, where we perceive reality, and the GI tract itself. The GI tract almost behaves independently. And you know, why is that the case? Probably because one of the first things that animals had to figure out how to do evolutionarily was digest. You know, if you're not digesting and absorbing, you're dying because you you're not getting any nutrients. So the gut system is much older than the central nervous system is. All right, so that's the neural system, enteric nervous system you can write here. And then the last one is hormonal control. So in addition to having its own nervous system, the gut also has a hormonal control system as well. So the gut is technically an endocrine organ, you know, like we started this semester talking about hormones and how they affect things. Well, the digestive tract, different places make different hormones. That hormone, those hormones travel through the blood and affect other places of the digestive tract. So for example, at the end of the, of the large intestine, there's a region that creates a hormone that affects the stomach all the way up at the beginning of the digestive tract, not through a neural system, but through a chemical system instead, through a hormonal system. And I, you know, the says there's 18 hormones. I'm not going to ask you to know 18 hormones of the digestive tract, but when we get there, there's a short list of hormones I am going to ask you to know because they come up clinically, but more on that later. All right. For now, three forms of control that occur in the whole digestive tract. And this starts at the mouth. You know, you're not down into the small intestine. You know, so for example, if you, um, if you take a drink of something acidic, you know, like a, a carbonated beverage, so increase, there is an increase in saliva production because of the drop in pH that results to the mucosa of the mouth. So these things are happening throughout the system. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so now we're going to go through our sort of 10-day tour of the, uh, of the digestive tract, of the GI tract. Okay, so first up is a point, this is a take home for the course. What is digestion, right? Di because the common person thinks digestion is everything that happens after they've chewed and swallowed, right? Not true in here, that's not digestion. Digestion is a chemical process that breaks down large molecules and small molecules. Well, why do we call this the digestive tract then? Because without that step, we don't have any access to the nutrients in the food that we eat. Okay? What organisms like plants and animals make, big complex molecules. You know, you've learned about some of them. Proteins, starches, you know, these are big, huge molecules, not of much use to another creature at all. But the building blocks of those molecules are, you know, cows make cow muscle. We eat that cow muscle. We break down those proteins into amino acids. 
we put those amino acids back together and we make our own muscle with it. So in order to have that transition happen from one organism to another, we have to have digestion. That's what we call it, the digestive system. Okay. <clears throat> so, okay, so just some examples. All right, so we started here at the top. So the big subdivisions of the digestive tract, what we find in the head is the, um, the oral cavity, the teeth, and the tongue. All right, so we're going to look at those first. Excuse me. Then the pharynx, which is pretty much in the neck. Um, that's going to come down here. We talked about it a little bit in the respiratory tract. The esophagus is the tube that connects the top and the bottom because we don't have any digestion that happens in the thorax, right? You know, the chest is all heart and lungs, so the digestive tract is further down. Um, certainly is one of those common spots um, in evolution. You know, if you look at animals from early, early ocean animals to, you know, advanced animals like we are, one common theme is that there's no digestion that happens where respiration and, and cardiovascular power happen. So it's one of those, well, yeah, they, that's all the same across the whole animal kingdom. Okay, then we get down to the stomach. The stomach empties into the small intestine, small intestine to the large intestine, um, and so on. Okay, so that's, these are the things we're going to cover, not this time, but getting into next time. But what are the general functions? You know, for every organ system, we've had a box like this, right? You know, what are the functions of this system? And there's always primary functions and then a few secondary functions. And the digestive tract is no different. Okay, so <clears throat> ingestion is the process of putting food and liquid into the digestive tract. So we commonly refer to this as eating, right? And ingestion, technically it begins with the brain. Right, because you know, unlike a filter feeder in in a um, ocean environment, you know, that's by breathing they're eating. We don't have that. If we're going to eat, it has to start with conscious thought first. Okay, so technically, ingestion begins with the brain, and then it's carried out with the nose and the mouth. Why the nose? Because smell is a big part of the stimulation for ingestion, and it actually stimulates digestion too. Okay, so that's ingestion. Mechanical processing is what the mouth does. So that's breaking up food mechanically, in other words, with motion. Okay, so we've got teeth, teeth go up and down, teeth also go around and around to grind, right? So we have that mechanical processing. The tongue plays a role here too. The tongue squishes stuff to the top of the mouth, to the hard palate, um, helps to mix things, mix saliva in there. So we get mechanical processing. Then there's swallowing at some point, and digestion begins. I already told you what that is. So digestion is chemical breakdown. Digestion can't happen, though, without secretion. Okay? There's a reason that, you know, a, um, uh, a corn, you know, corn kernels, they don't self-digest. You know, so how do we digest them? Well, we have to put chemicals into the system to make that digestion happen. No different than what you do in the chemistry lab. If you're going to take a large molecule and break it into a smaller molecule, well, you're going to need some reactants, right, to make that happen. Well, the body has to have that same thing. So we do secretion in order to make digestion happen. So the body puts its reaction creators into the digestive tract to trigger then digestion. So we have secretion. In the end, the reason we do this, we secrete to digest so that we can absorb, because we want to bring those nutrient molecules, those building block molecules, into the body where they can be used, right? So we get absorption. We also have to reabsorb all the stuff that we put in to the digestive tract, too. You know, so saliva, for example, as well in our conscious awareness when we eat it, if you pay attention to it. Well, where does that saliva go? Well, it gets mixed up with the food, you swallow it, and the good parts of that saliva are reabsorbed so they can be used again. You know, we're, we are great recyclers as human beings. You know, we, anything that we make to do something, we typically reabsorb most of it so we don't lose it all the time. Just like we saw with, he, uh, with iron and hemoglobin, you know, how it's just recycled over and over and over again. We do the same thing with water and salt in the digestive tract. Okay, so secretion and absorption. And then finally, there's compaction. 
So as land animals in particular, we need to reduce the amount of feces we produce. You know, otherwise we would have a feces problem. We'd have to keep moving all the time, right? So compaction is what the large intestine does. And what that is, is it's removing uh, fluid from what's um, going to be excreted, as well as anything that's useful, you know, so salt, for example, sodium chloride, potassium, calcium, all of those things are pulled back in in the, the large intestine where compaction occurs. Okay, so we're going to talk about all of these different processes um, <clears throat> as we go from the top um, all the way to bottom. Okay, so we got a little time to start talking about the mouth. <clears throat> okay, so we talked about the nasal cavity in the last chapter. So now we'll focus on what's below it. Okay, so along the bottom of the nasal cavity, top of the mouth, we have the palate. Okay, so that's this whole thing. The palate has a bony part and it has a soft floppy part. So we have the hard palate and the soft palate. Now, there's a reason why we have this bone here. It isn't just by happenstance. Um, because of how we breathe, remember we lower the pressure in order to pull air in? If the hard palate was floppy, every time we breathed in, it would have a tendency to move up, and every time we breathed out, it would push down. So by being rigid, it stays in place, even as the air pressure changes on both sides of it. Okay, so we got the hard palate and the soft palate. The soft palate ends with the uvula, that's that little pendulum thing that hangs down at the back of your throat. Right? We have a palatine tonsil on both sides. We've got a lingual tonsil that we can't really see that sits tucked in here between the tongue and the epiglottis. This whole massive thing is the tongue. The tongue is a lot larger than you think. You know, when you look at the mirror, you know, stick your tongue out, it doesn't look very big. But your tongue actually goes way down into the base of your uh, uh, mouth, between your, the open part of your jawbone. So this whole big thing is the tongue. The tongue is the most agile muscle in the body. It can move in more ways than any other muscle can. Um, and the reason for that is because in chewing, it has to keep moving food around without, of course, getting chewed itself, right? So it has to be very agile in order to do those things. It also is the principal force in swallowing, too, that it pushes the food back into the swallowing zone back here, which we'll talk about more next time. Okay, here in the front, this is the lip, also called the labium. Right? It's really just soft tissue. It has a little muscle in it, so you can move it around and change its shape. Um, and then we have the cheek over here off to the side. So these are all, believe it or not, this is anatomy, but these are all terms that you have heard before right now. Okay. So along the bottom of the oral cavity, we have some muscles you hardly ever hear about um, that make up the floor of the, of the mouth. If you push up on the bottom of your chin, those are those inferior boundary of the oral cavity muscles. But... You'll, you will learn those happily in your clinical anatomy course, many of you will, but not in this course. Okay. And this is actually a really good picture because the head and neck exam, which you all have experienced because you've all gone to the doctor and somebody has said, say ah, right? And it's not just for show. It's because in, you can really get a good view of the mouth in that very simple way. And the mouth represents... Um, the, uh, the first part of the digestive mucosa, it also represents part of the respiratory mucosa. So it's worth doing, right? So you have a frenulum in the front. That's this the little tie that ties the lips to the gums. You have, uh, that's the labial frenulum. Then you have a lingual frenulum underneath the tongue. So to see this in a patient, you have to say, you know, say, ah, and now lift your tongue, you know, point your tongue to the roof of your mouth and you can see that. On each side of the uh, lingual frenulum are some of the uh, salivary gland ducts, the salivary glands of the mouth. Okay, so there's the tongue. Um, the uvula is here. This is called the pharyngeal arch. That's the back one. The front one, do you see how there's two, right? The front one is the palatine arch. So this is the soft palate arch. And then this is the pharyngeal arch back here. Between the two of those in most people are the palatine tonsils, right? And obviously in a two-dimensional picture, there's no depth where you can see that a little bit easier. All right. Uh, da, 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 arch. Okay. Which part of the mouth, huh? which part of the mouth with infants do they um, 
alter or the tongue, do they alter if, if it's too long so they don't like develop a lip later? Um, I think you're talking about the formula. Tongue tie? Is that what you're talking about? I think so, yeah. Yeah. In, in some kids, and adults even, the lingual frenulum extends all the way up to the tip of the tongue. Okay. Um, the attitudes have changed about this. It used to be they would snip a frenulum for any reason. You know, if the baby coughed and then fed at the same time, oh, that's a cut of the frenulum. Now it's not done nearly as often. It's done when there's real problems feeding. Um, or in the extreme case where the child can't actually move their tongue out of their mouth because that can then have trouble with um, enunciation later on. It's a simple little procedure because it's a little thin lack of tissue, but you'll hear it called tongue tie, you know, oh, you were tongue tied or my kid was tongue tied. It just means the frenulum went further up the tongue than, it's, than it usually does. Does that answer your question? Yes. Others? Okay. We're going to teach and call it a Okay, so you've probably all seen this before in your health classes, right? Because for whatever reason, we learn more about teeth, I think, early on than we learn about any other part of the body. But um, <clears throat> we have the top part of the tooth, the white part is the crown. Um, on top of the crown is the enamel. Enamel is the hardest stuff in the body, way harder than bone, um, and it's uh, hugely, hugely durable. It, Enamel will persist after death, even for you know 100 or more years, depending on the environment. But we have enamel. Underneath the enamel is softer and stronger, but not harder, dentin. So that's this region. It makes up most of the mass of the tooth. This, the volume of it is dentin. Inside, we have the pulp cavity, which has arteries, veins, and nerves. And you might say, why? It's because the whole tooth is alive, You know, the, even the enamel which is really just a hard covering, it has cells embedded in it and along underneath it to constantly be refreshing it all the time. You know, so your teeth, your enamel is never as old as you are, you're never as old as your teeth are, because it's being constantly replaced, just like bone is. So it keeps teeth nice and strong and healthy. The part of the teeth that match other teeth are called, that's the occlusal surface, so when you bite down, your occlusal surfaces are touching. The neck is the part of the tooth that sits in the gum line, and then the root is the part of the tooth that's embedded in the jaw. So it's either the jaw bone, the mandible on the bottom, or it's the maxillary bones on the top, or the upper jaw bones, where these teeth are locked in. And they're uh, attached to, um, the, the uh, tooth is attached to the bone with all of these very strong threads. Do you see how there's two, three lines here, and three lines here, and three lines here? Well, those threads are the periodontal ligaments. Again, some of the toughest stuff in the body. But it means that the tooth actually has a suspension system. These ligaments can flex a little bit. So as we chew, which is enormous force, this tooth can actually wiggle ever so much because of how it's it's suspended in this socket rather than being glued to it. Is that why braces work? Well, uh, braces work because when you tug on the teeth, the socket moves. Okay. Yeah, so it's somewhat, it has to do with how they're suspended in there. Yeah, but we're out of time for today. So we'll pick up in uh, on teeth next time.